jump right in where we left off. I hope you know the context by now of what we're dealing with here in 1 Peter uh, as a whole, but also here in the immediate context of where we've been in chapter 4. So I'll not take the time to review a lot because we want to, like I said, try to finish the chapter. And so we'll pick it up in verse 12. 1 Peter 4 verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happen unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So this fiery trial, the fiery trial Peter's talking about, I believe, has application to the future 70th week of Daniel. I mean, that's a fiery trial. And uh, remember how this started out in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1 verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trying of your faith. Uh, Israel has got to go through a fiery trial to purify the nation and to purge out the rebel from the nation. Um, they have to have their faith tried. James talks about them being justified by faith and works. Their faith must work. They've got to prove their faith by their works by enduring to the end, Jesus said in Matthew 24. In this age of grace, we are instantly justified by the faith of Christ, Paul said. He's the only one who teaches that doctrine. It's for this age of grace. But when you, when you hit that issue of the 70th week of Daniel, it's about a man's faith. And a man's faith must be tried. It must be proven. And so the issue is still faith, but there's a distinction, obviously, between being justified by the faith of Christ, and yes, we need to put our faith in Christ to receive that justification. But Christ's faith is perfect. It is proven. That's why our justification is instant. But in the tribulation, being justified by their own faith, they're going to have to prove that faith by rejecting the Antichrist. They're going to have to prove that faith by enduring to the end, being faithful unto death. And so this thing of a fiery trial, I mean, we have trouble in this life. There are things we go through. But when you talk about that 70th week of Daniel, Jesus said it's going to be like nothing this world's ever seen. We can't even begin to fathom what a trial it will be. And, uh, but they're not to think it a strange thing. Why would it be strange if they believed the Word of God? Because has not the Word of God told them it was coming? I mean, the, the, you know, do you realize how much Scripture concerns the 70th week of Daniel? We commonly refer to it as the tribulation period, that final seven years before the second coming of Christ. Do you have any idea how much Scripture deals with that? A lot. And so they've been warned. And I'm not going to run all the references on this. We've, we've noted this already in our studies, but I'll give you a reminder in Zechariah, if you'll flip back to Zechariah chapter 13. Uh, in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, that fiery trial is not for the body of Christ. We're going to be removed before that happens. There's a great dispensational change between this present age of grace and the wrath to come. So we're going to be out of here. It's got to do with Jacob, Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble. God's going to punish the world, it says in Isaiah 13, in the day of the Lord. But he's also going to purge Israel. Now, Zechariah 13, Zechariah 13 and verse number 9, God said, and I'll bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. 
They'll be born again as a nation. Hosea 1, God said, not my people. Well, that's going to change. And notice he says a third, because it's the remnant, it's the minority that follows the true Christ. Do you realize that the majority of Israel will actually be deceived by the Antichrist and follow the Antichrist? And they'll turn on their believing brethren. And uh, they'll do a lot of contact tracing and surveillance. By the way, everything's being preconditioned. We're not in the tribulation, but if you can't see that people are being preconditioned to accept what's coming, then you're just refusing to see the reality of matters. We're, we're living in some crazy times. And we're not in the tribulation, but the stage is being set. It's not hard to see that. The world is ready to receive the mark of the beast. There's no doubt in my mind. They've proven that by their actions here in recent times. It's not going to be difficult for the Antichrist to enforce his mark. He says, Antichrist is going to say, take the mark or no toilet paper. Everybody say, good night. Give me the mark of the beast. I'd rather go to hell than not have toilet paper. That's how, that's how people are, man. Foolish. Amen. This is the times we live in. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> they've been programmed. What do they call it on TV? They say, watch our what? Programs? They want you to watch our programs and our channel. They're trying to channel something. Television? What are they trying to tell you? A vision. <laughs> and uh, you, better, you better be renewed in the spirit of your mind instead of being conformed to this world. So, again... This issue of the fiery trial, uh, look at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Alright, look in chapter 4, Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness. Notice that capital S, S-U-N, the Son. The Son of Righteousness arise with healings in His wings, his, his, the brightness of His glory, his, the, his rays of light, so to speak. And shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. And the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. This fiery trial... Is when you talk about the 70th week, it's going to be used both to purify and to destroy. Those that have faith in the Lord will be purified through it. Those that don't will be destroyed through it. The same fiery trial will purify and burn up. Okay? So the same Son of Righteousness will both save His people and destroy His enemies at the second coming of Christ. And so... Israel has had an issue with idolatry down through her history. Israel rejected their Messiah as a nation. They must be purified. They must be tried. They must go through that in preparation for the new covenant and the return of Christ. All right, so back in 1 Peter, he said, Don't think it's strange. As though some strange thing has happened unto you. I mean, this has long been foretold. Instead of thinking it's strange, what you ought to do is rejoice. Inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. Remember now, Peter's emphasizing suffering, but he's talking about suffering in the will of God. He's talking about suffering for righteousness' sake. He's talking about suffering for the name of Christ. 
If you're partakers of that, he said that when his glory shall be revealed, you'll be glad also with exceeding joy. So if they really believe the promise of God concerning the return of Christ and glory and power, they ought to be rejoicing in the midst of their suffering because of what it's going to produce uh, through them, and there's going to be great reward. Uh, 1 Peter 1 again, verse 5. 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the last time of prophecy. Concerns the second coming of Christ. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. See, it's temporary. It's not forever. Weeping endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning, says in Psalms. But now for a season, if need be. Yeah, and it need be. It's, it's determined upon them. You are in heaviness through manifold temptations. The temptations of that fiery trial is just, it's severe. He said, but the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. They know him through faith. And whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. Now, if there's any doubt we're talking about the salvation of Israel at the second coming, this next verse is clear. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Well, the mystery of the body of Christ was hid from the prophets. They didn't write about it. So the, Peter's talking about a salvation that was prophesied, and it's got to do with Israel. Who prophesied the grace that should come unto you. That's the grace of the new covenant, second coming. And so on. Um, look back and always keep a marker in 1 Peter, but look in John 16. John chapter 16. So if they really believe what the Word of God says, they know what they're going through, why they're going through it, and they know it's going to end, that the Lord's going to come, and they're going to receive glory, and they're going to be rewarded, and they're going to reign in the kingdom. So they're rejoicing in the midst of their suffering if they believe the Word of God. John 16, 16. A little while, and you shall not see me. Now, as we read this passage, he said the, 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 the phrase a little while is used seven times. It just happens to be seven times. Seven years of tribulation. A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. See, at this point, the age in which we're living in wasn't revealed. So it was going to be just a little while before the Lord returned. When He ascended up in their sight in Acts chapter 1, the angel said to the apostles, He's going to come back in the same manner. <laughs> He's coming back. The, they were to be looking to go through the they were going to go through the tribulation he would return it would be just a little while the mystery of this age wasn't revealed yet that was given through the apostle paul later um, then said some of his disciples among themselves what is this that he saith unto us a little while and you shall not see me and again a little while and you shall see me and because i go to the father they said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto him, Do you inquire among yourselves of what I said? A little while you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me. Very, verily I say unto you that you, you shall weep and lament. Okay, it's going to be tough. But the world shall rejoice. But see, that the tables are going to turn pretty quick. His people are going to go through weeping. The world's going to be rejoicing. But then his people are going to be rejoicing and the world's going to be weeping. Babylon has fallen. <laughs> you know, when, when that's when that said in the book of Revelation, there's rejoicing in heaven. There's weeping on earth. See, it's going to, the tables are going to turn. Um, he said, You shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she's in travail, hath sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy 
that a man is born of the world. And yet now therefore have sorrow, but I'll see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So back to 1 Peter, that's, that's what Peter's saying. Look, you're going through this fiery trial. It's not a strange thing. What you ought to be doing is rejoicing because you're partakers of his sufferings and he's coming in glory. And when that glory is revealed, you're going to have exceeding joy. The issue in 1 Peter is suffering, then glory. Suffering, then glory. I mean, that, there's a, a real emphasis on that in this epistle. Now, we're talking about Israel, we're talking about the 70th week of Daniel, but is there not an application for us today? I mean, when it comes to having tribulation, why, why should we think it's strange when we go through tribulation? We're not going through the tribulation that's determined on Israel, but we will have tribulation in this life. And why should we think it's strange when the Bible told us it would be this way? Uh, we should expect trouble. We should expect tribulation in this life. We, we also know that our glory is coming. Paul said, I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. That's in Romans 8. So we know there's suffering now, but glory will come when the Lord comes for us. There's a difference between the rapture of the body of Christ and the return of Christ to the earth but the same principle holds in terms of first suffering, then glory. Look in, uh, and there's so many verses I can give you, but um, how about 1 Thessalonians 3 for an example? 1 Thessalonians 3. I mean, Paul said we're appointed to suffer for Christ's sake. He said that in Philippians 1, verse 29. I mean, there, and there are many verses where Paul tells us what to expect. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. But no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. He told, this was a, a young church, new in the faith, young in the faith. He told them up front, if you're going to believe the Word of God and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer for it. But that's what Paul taught new converts. <laughs> and yet, today, I mean, this positive only stuff that preachers are spouting, they're not being honest with people. And so when they suffer, they say, well, God's mad at me. What's going on? They don't understand. They should be prepared. They should be taught the truth about why God allows suffering. And I don't believe God's causing it, but He allows it to teach us some things. And He told us it would be this way. But hey, the good news is any suffering we have now is temporary. And the glory we're going to have with Christ is eternal. When you put it in that perspective, it's manageable. Okay, and there's a lot we can learn through it. And so there's a principle that we can apply here. All right, 1 Peter 5 verse 14. Excuse me, 4 verse 14. I skipped the whole... <laughs> now we're really picking up pace now, right? 5.14 is the last verse of the whole epistle. We just skip to the end. 1 Peter 4.14 if, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. <laughs> if you have the right understanding. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Reproached reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are ye. It, it's a privilege to bear reproach for Jesus Christ. I mean, who do you love? The Lord of the world. Well, it bothers so many professing Christians to have any reproach from this world. To me, it's a badge. It makes me know I'm on the right track. The 
world, look, folks, the world hates Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the Christ of the Bible. There's another Jesus in churches that's counterfeit, Paul warned about. You want to know how I know the world hates Jesus Christ? Guess who said that? Jesus Christ said that. I think he knows what he's talking about. Okay. And do you think that changed in this age of grace? Do you think all of a sudden the world now loves Jesus Christ? No, this world's in darkness and Christ is the light. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. What does it mean to be reproached? Look in Psalm 44. Psalm 44. You'll see some parallelism, and the Bible will often do that. It'll take a word, and it'll give you a number of other words in the context to help you understand that word. All right, so Psalm 44, verse 13. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors. Following, if you're following God, this is what's going to happen. Now, notice the, the parallels as far as the other words used. Psalm 44, 13. Thou make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou make us us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. When you have reproach, there's scorn. There's derision. It's like you're a byword. People shake their head at you. There's shame. Okay? That's the reality. If you be reproached for the name of Christ... Happy are ye. <laughs> Why did Jesus say that? Because remember what he said in Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, verse 10. Remember what Christ said. In Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. That's a reproach when they're reviling you. And persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Hey, if you're being reproached for the name of Christ, you're in good company. Okay? And there's a reward to endure that. In Matthew 10, Jesus in talking about he says things in Matthew 10 that apply to the tribulation period. And he said in verse 22, And ye shall be hated of all men. Why? For my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. That's not talking about this age. That's talking about enduring to the end of the world. Or enduring to the end of your life or whatever. Being faithful unto death. It's talking about enduring that fiery trial. That's what he's talking about. But he said, if, but if, if, if they're going to hate you for my name's sake. And so this issue of reproach. In Hebrews 11. I think we looked at this already in our study. But in Hebrews 11, let me remind you about Moses. Verse 26, how esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Those who are going to walk by faith in the fiery trial are going to be willing to reject the beast and get their head cut off. And count it a joy to know that they're going to be resurrected and reign in the kingdom. They don't care about the riches of Egypt. They're going to reject that. They choose the treasures uh, of the reproach of Christ. By the way, Hebrews 13, 13. Hebrews 13, 13. If you were to take a guess of how many words were in that verse, how many would you think? There's 13 words in Hebrews 13, verse 13. It's, 13 is a number of separation in the Word of God. Let us go forth, 
therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And he says, for we, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. They're looking for that kingdom. Bearing his reproach. All right. Now, Peter said on your part, he said, if, you, if, you're, if you're being reproached in the name of Christ, you ought to be happy about it because the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Now, that's interesting language. He says resting. The spirit resting. Paul never uses that language. But I just find that interesting the way he said that. But he said, on their part, he's evil spoken of. This world hates Christ. They speak evil of him. But on your part, he's glorified. So you have people, you have the world out there using the name of Christ as a cuss word. And then you have people like us who bow the knee and worship Christ and glorify his name. Whose side are you on? I mean, you know, they're, they're talking about a division. You're talking about a great divide. In 1 Peter 2, 7, he said, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. The same Lord is both loved and hated. That's the way it is. Now, again, what about us today? Didn't Paul teach something similar about reproach? Oh yeah, there's a lot of verses, but I'll give you one example. 1 Timothy 4, verse number 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little. Amen and amen. I, like, I just like the statement there. Now that's, of course, that's talking about, that's talking about the um, exercise of religion. Religious discipline, if you look at it in context. But godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. If you live godly, it's good now. It's going to be even better to come, in the, in the world to come, the life to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Why are we willing to labor and suffer reproach? Because we trust in the living God who's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. We ought to be willing to labor and suffer reproach because we have a promise that if we live godly, we will suffer persecution, but we'll also be rewarded. All right, 1 Peter 4, verse 15. I just looked at the clock and realized we got to get going here. 1 Peter 4, 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. In other words, he's saying, look, don't bring suffering upon yourself. You're going to suffer enough as it is. Don't bring more on yourself through sin. And I think there's a hint here that maybe they'd be tempted to retaliate in persecution. I mean, I, I might be tempted to murder someone that's persecuting me enough. Don't, don't look at me like that. If somebody's trying to get after you and kill you. Don't act like you don't have a thought you might want to kill them. I mean, I don't want to, but I mean, when somebody's trying to kill you, you know. But what, see, they're told to, to practice non-resistance to lay down their life and martyr them looking for the resurrection. Now, we're, Paul told us to, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. It's not always possible. Okay. So we can defend ourselves and our families. But there's going to be this thing of they may want to retaliate and, and, and you know, steal or, or kill or, be a, or, you know, no, he said, don't bring any more suffering on yourself through sin. Trust the Lord. Live as a Christian. If you're going to suffer as a Christian, and by the way, a busy body in other men's matters. I've always loved how Peter threw that in there with murder and, and, and being a thief and being a busy body in other men's matters. I mean, that, that causes a lot of problems. That's a terrible thing. God, when God said there were things that he hates, he said one of those is he that soweth discord among the brethren. So, I mean, that's a serious thing that we ought not to take lightly. He said, don't do any of that, but rather, if you're going to suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed of that, but glorify God. 
Um, in other words, don't bring suffering on yourself through sin, but if you live as a Christian, suffering will find you. Christ suffered for our sake. We should be willing to suffer for His. Now, not that we could ever repay Him, but that we love Him. And we should be willing to suffer to glorify Him. The name Christian is found just three times in the Bible. The whole Bible, three times. Twice in the book of Acts, Acts 11.26, talking about the believers at Antioch, Paul's home base for ministry. And then, um, was it Agrippa in Acts 26? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He said that to Paul. And then here Peter uses it. Christian simply means like Christ, following Christ. And it applies to both the body of Christ today and uh, the believing remnant of Israel in the tribulation. I mean, if you follow Christ, then you ought to be known as a Christian. So, uh, it's, it's not something that we went around calling ourselves, but it's something that kind of stuck with us. Uh, in fact, initially it was uh, used to be a reproach. Oh, you're a Christian. But what an honor to be called a Christian. All right? That somebody would say, hey, you, you're like Christ. I mean, what an honor. They might mean that in a negative way, but what a, what a wonderful privilege and testimony. And so nothing wrong with using that name, and we use it today. And, uh, but he's saying if you're suffering as a Christian because you're following Christ, don't be ashamed of that, but glorify God. And look, one of the ways they're going to glorify God is they're going to lay down their life. Now, there are martyrs still today, down through church history. What, what a testimony that people are willing to die for the name of Christ. And we don't have to do that to go to heaven. We're, we go to heaven because he, Christ died for us. So what a testimony that Christians have been willing to lay down their life, knowing they don't have to. See, the Muslims do it because they're trying to earn paradise. They think that's their only hope. But when Christians do it, not having to, knowing they're already going to heaven, what a testimony that is. In John 21, 19, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. John 21, 19, the Lord told Peter how he was going to die. He said, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. They say Peter was crucified and that he was crucified upside down because he, didn't want to, he wasn't worthy to die in the same way his Lord did. The Bible doesn't say that, but it's an indication Christ kind of implied that he would be crucified and history says he was, but it glorified God. All right, let's finish up here. Verse 17, 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall, the end of, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the, righteously, uh, the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, what Peter says here, to me, makes it crystal clear he's not writing to the body of Christ. You can't look at the body of Christ and say, if you're scarcely saved. Paul, Paul never even came close to saying something. In fact, Paul talked about how abundantly we're saved. It wasn't like you just got in. I mean, he never used... And, and, and that judgment must begin at us? Uh, this is going to be a time of judgment. This is going to be the fiery trial of the tribulation. All that fits when you leave it in context and rightly divide the word of truth. He said the time has come. What time? Remember 1 Peter 4, 7? The end of all things is at hand. That's not true today. The end of the world is not at hand. What is at hand is the coming of the Lord for the church to be caught up to meet Him in the air. Then there's going to be probably a gap and then there's going to be seven years at the end of which Christ will return and the world will end. Paul taught that the coming of the Lord for the church is at hand, but that the, but that the day of, the, of Christ in terms of the second coming is not at hand, 2 Thessalonians. So the time has come 
the time for the end of all things. The time has come that judgment must begin. This fiery trial, the tribulation, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It must begin at the house of God. Now, he's not talking about the church, the body of Christ. The house of God is the house of Israel, the true believing Israel. Remember, in 1 Peter 2, 5, he said, you're a spiritual house. And notice what he said there, 1 Peter 2, 5. Um, he also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And then he goes on to talk about in verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. The body of Christ is not a nation. That's talking about the little flock of believing Israel. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said, to hold fast your hope firm unto the end, he said, he said, whose house are we if we hold fast? Hebrews 3, verse 6. Whose house are we if we hold fast? You know, they got to make it to the end. Talking about that, look, I, and Hebrews 3 also said we're made partakers of Christ if. But see, I was made a partaker of Christ the moment I believed the gospel. Baptized by one spirit and one body. So here in the context, when he talks about the house of God, he's talking about the believing remnant of Israel, the house of Israel. And he says uh, in verse 18, it's the righteous. It, he said, it must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, us the believing remnant, the righteous, verse 18, it's got to begin. And why must it begin with God's people? Uh, in Ezekiel 9, um, in, uh, concerning God bringing judgment, he said, begin at my sanctuary. Go through and start killing. You can read it. It's in Ezekiel 9. Mark some people that you're going to spare. The rest of them kill them. He said, begin in my sanctuary. Well, the principle is, of whom much is given, much is required. Isn't that what Jesus said in Luke 12? In Amos 3, verse 1 and 2, don't turn there, we're running out of time. But basically God is saying, I'm going to judge you because you're my people who know better. You know better. So it must begin at you. To whom much is given, much is required. And Peter said, he said, um, it must begin at us. Well, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, the gospel of God is simply God's good news concerning Christ being the seed of David risen from the dead. It's a very basic message. Paul talked about it in Romans 1. I believe there's a distinction between the gospel, the gospel of God and the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God is further revelation concerning what Christ accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. But the basic fact that Jesus is the Christ, the seed of David, and that he rose from the dead, uh, that's the basis of any good news, right? So both Peter and Paul preach the gospel of God, and they're to obey the gospel of God, and the way you do that is believe it. Okay, And he said, but if they don't, what will the end be? Well, the end will be, if you don't believe the truth, you don't believe the gospel of God, their end is going to be uh, eternal damnation. Jesus told the Pharisees who had rejected him, he called them vipers, and he said in Matthew 23, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? They can't escape if they don't believe. And so we know what their end will be. Now, Peter said, if the righteous scarcely be saved... If the righteous scarcely be saved. Now, why in the world would he put it that way? Again, that's very different from what anything Paul ever said to us. So why would he put it that way because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24? Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world at this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. There, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or, lo, or there, believe it not, for there shall rise false Christ, false prophets, show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But he said, it's going to be a time like never. And, and, and so they're going to make it by the skin of their teeth. I mean, it's going to be a fiery trial. And there it's, he said, scarcely be saved to make it through this time. He's talking about the tribulation period. Well, where shall the ungodly and a sinner appear? Well, read Revelation 20 and you'll find out. Great white throne judgment. All those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast in the lake of fire. 
Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? By the way, I find it interesting. Paul in Romans 5 talked about the ungodly and the sinner and talked about how God loved us while we were yet sinners and talked about how we have now received the atonement and we can be justified and saved from the wrath to come. All right, verse 19, and we're done. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. So there, this, is, this is what, if you remember the example of Christ that Peter gave in 1 Peter 2 at the end of the chapter, he talked about how Christ committed Himself to Him that judgeth righteously. As Christ suffered on the cross, how He committed Himself to the Father. And, and Peter's saying, look, you need to follow that example. And as you suffer in the will of God, as you suffer as a Christian, you just commit the keeping of your soul to Him. He's a faithful creator. He said, you need to do it in well-doing. <laughs> you, you need to do the right thing by faith. But at the end of the day, God's going to keep them. Jude talked about how the Lord will preserve them. And, and so they're not going to be able to make it through without trusting in God and committing themselves to God. Mark these down. We won't turn there because we're out of time, unfortunately. But Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31 in Isaiah 43, 15, I'll just tell you what it says. It talks about, well, Isaiah 40 is that familiar passage, you know. Um, they shall run and not be weary. <laughs> they shall walk and not faint, right? As eagles' wings, you know. Trusting, he, he, but he, he refers to the Lord as their creator and how they need to depend on him. And I believe it, it refers to getting them through the tribulation. And then in Isaiah 43, 15, he's called the creator uh, of Israel, basically. So yes, he's the creator of all, but he created that nation. They need to trust him as their faithful creator to get them through. All right, so Lord willing, we'll pick it up next time. Maybe two more lessons to finish out the epistle. And um, yes, we got to rightly divide the word of truth and understand the dispensational setting. But as I've been showing you all through this study, there are things Peter says that still apply today. Okay, you got to know the difference between doctrine and application. And we try to, we, we want to use both because we need to. Father, thank you.